So my name is Justin Searle and uh, I'm a managing partner for a company called Utilisec. And what I do is I specialize in doing penetration testing of critical infrastructure. So different systems like SCADA systems and control systems that run and manage the oil, the water, the gas, the sewer, uh, transportation, manufacturing, and the energy that we all live and enjoy in our lives. The things that we can't do without and that nations can't live without. So what I do is I specialize in doing that assessment and doing that type of work and I own and run a company that does that called Utilisec. So we offer various different types of services um, to electric utilities, to oil, water and gas companies, to the vendors that actually create large equipment for large SCADA equipment for these organizations. And we offer services for doing, going in and helping either build their architecture or review their architecture, help them set up different types of security programs, do provide training for them, as well as do security testing for them. So what I hear today to talk about is just a little bit about an open source project that I started a year ago to try to help all the companies that, that deal with SCADA um, equipment and critical infrastructure as well as all the people out there trying to get in and trying to understand and learn some of this, diff this different equipment. So in the past I've given several different presentations and you can find many of my presentations online if you just Google for my name. Um, but some of the presentations that I've given um, have gone through and talked about the different types of architectures that we have inside of critical infrastructure and control systems. Um, talking about specifically energy companies and, and some of the challenges they face and some of the, the ways that they're trying to deal with those challenges. I've also gone through and talked a lot about, do, uh, about a testing methodology, a methodology for, for performing penetration testing on control systems in critical infrastructure. So both of these presentations as well as many other presentations are, are available online. But really this project that I'm talking about today is a continuation of this, this work and this effort that I've been working on throughout my career. Is trying to provide some method in some way that we can systematically test and try to find the vulnerabilities in, our, in these control systems and try to build different types of defenses to mitigate these, different, these, these challenges we face. So when we look at control systems and the different systems that we have the, in, around SCADA that, that control and manage the, the oil, the water, and the gas, one thing that we have when we're trying to deal with, with the security of these systems is trying to test these systems. Many of these systems are so critical that if we perform penetration tests and we mess something up or we make a mistake, often we can actually stop that flow of oil or stop that flow of gas or turn off electricity for an entire city which is usually considered a bad thing. So we have to be very, very careful in what we're doing. And so there's many challenges that we face trying to deal with, with how we can successfully test some of these critical infrastructure systems. And as we're trying to test these systems, one of the biggest things that we have is that we don't have, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges we have is we simply don't have enough people out there to perform this type of work. Many of the companies that have these types of systems, they will, they will hire different types of security teams to try to help build policy, help build um, security defenses, and look at the risk to understand the risk to these organizations. But when these organizations come across the fact that they need to try to test for security flaws, they need to try to find the different, the different vulnerabilities in these systems, they often feel very challenged and don't know where to go because often they don't have experienced staff on hand to be able to perform this type of work. And when they go to look for third-party consultants to come in and do this work, they often can't find third-party consultants that have that experience. Um, so these were some of the big challenges that we faced. Many of us that do, now out of curiosity, for people in the audience, how many people in here have performed or do currently perform penetration testing? Okay, so we have many people in here that do penetration testing. And if you were an oil or a water or a gas company that wants to find and ask one of these individuals to do penetration testing for them or for you, these individuals may know how to do penetration testing, but they may not have ever looked at some of these control systems. They may not know some of the challenges they face or some of the risks they face or know that many of the penetration testing tools that we often use things that we think cause no damage or no harm, like running a simple Nmap scan. They don't realize that a simple Nmap scan might actually crash some of these systems. 
So while many of us with penetration testing skills that have worked in this industry, we have 80 to 90% of the knowledge to be able to work and perform, perform tests and security assessments on critical infrastructure. We often don't understand what that remaining 20% is. We don't know what additional skills we have or what are the current skills that we have needs to be changed or modified to be able to do it successfully. So another, another problem that we have is we often have very few security tools that work specifically with some of these control systems. While we have tools like Kali and Backtrack to help us do penetration testing on most IT network systems, we don't have tools to help us with some of the, the control systems and the SCADA protocols, um, which has been another challenge. So throughout, throughout my career and over the last several years, one of, the, one of the efforts that I was working on was trying to build this methodology as I, as I referenced in a, in a previous presentation. And this methodology, one question that I had many people ask me after I published this methodology is a, a free published document people can download and, and read, is, well, here's your methodology. Here's 56 different steps to perform a penetration test inside of a control system. Where are the tools? What do we do? You say that this step we need to perform this type of a work, but what tool should I use to, to perform those, those steps? Which led me to decide that I really needed to try to provide some type of, some type of a, a framework for people to be able to do this, this work, some type of documentation and tool to be able to perform this type of work. And so this, and thus this uh, new project, one of my new projects was born, which was Samurai STFU, the Security Testing Framework for Utilities. So over the last five and a half years, I've been running another project for web penetration testers. Uh, the project that we run is called the Samurai WTF, the Web Testing Framework. Now everybody always gets all the acronyms mixed up. Okay, <laughs> Web Testing Framework, Security Testing Framework for Utilities. Um, now with these two different projects, um, both of them are entirely open source, free to download, free to modify, free to customize for your organizations. And with Samurai WTF, we've been running for about five years now. And actually about five and a half, we're going on five and a half years uh, with, that, with this project. And we've had about 14 different releases in those five and a half years. And our distribution, if any, if any of you have ever played with Samurai WTF or have ever looked at Samurai WTF, it's very similar to what you would expect with Kali or Backtrack. The difference is Samurai WTF is entirely made for web pen testers, okay? Doing penetration testing on web applications. We have many more tools for doing web penetration tests than what Kali and Backtrack have. And our entire distribution has been configured and set up to help aid you in doing these web penetration tests. So when you open up a web browser, all the web tools are pre-configured to work with that browser. And all the tools are pre-configured to work with each other. So our goal with Samurai WTF was not just to provide a distribution with many different tools like Backtrack and Kali, but provide a framework of tools that work together that helped you do your work and be very efficient at the work that you're, that you're doing. So I took this knowledge from Samurai WTF and I adopted it into a new project, a sister project called the Samurai SDFU, which allows electric utilities, oil, water, gas companies, any company that deals with SCADA systems and critical infrastructure to be able to have a testing, a testing framework that they can obtain freely, download online, no registration required, that they can modify for their own uses, that they can build their own internal training programs around to help them become more secure. And not just in the United States where I live, but worldwide, because this is a challenge that we all face. All of us need our oil, all of us need our gas, all of us need our water, all of us need electricity. And so these are some very important challenges we all face. So when, as building this distribution, my primary audience, the people that I made this for first and foremost, is those companies that are dealing with critical infrastructure that have it inside of their organizations. But the secondary audience that I have really are all the security professionals worldwide that are trying to learn how they can try to offer services and try to help these companies be able to become more secure or try to get jobs and careers inside of these different organizations. And then my third audience, which I don't have stated on the slide, really is academia. The different universities that are out there that are trying to teach new workforce coming in, uh, new, new students and, and new individuals that are trying to come into our workforce to encourage them and to entice them to come in and, and help us build a, a stronger labor force for, for security out there. 
Now, some of the other issue, the other goals that I have for this distribution that I've been working on, and I have about th we have three releases out of Samurai STFU right now. We're on release 1.3, 1.4 will be released uh, either in December or January. But um, some of the overarching goals for this is to try to provide some of the best network pen testing tools. So not everything that Kali and Backtrack have, but the tools that we can't live without. The, the, the Nmaps, the Wiresharks, the Metasploits, the things that are kind of the core of what we do as penetration testers. So we have the most important network pen testing tools at our fingertips without having all the extra clutter that we don't necessarily need. Also have some of the best web pen testing tools. So take some of the best tools that I have in Samurai WTF, the things that I can't live without, like Burp Suite and Z-Attack Proxy and W3AF, some of these other tools that we have for the web world, include them inside of this distribution. As well as many of the tools that don't really have a home in a lot of the pen testing distributions. Some of the tools to do electronic pen testing, okay, of electronic devices, embedded electronics. Um, some of the tools to do proprietary radio frequency assessments and include those inside of this distribution as well. And once again, not just include the tools, but include information on a testing methodology. Inf include information on uh, documentation on how to try to do some of this work. And include samples of packet captures, of dumps from EEPROM devices, of raw RF communication that has been captured that you can go and replay and, and test your analysis on to provide samples of bus snooping, of captured information between electronic components. So that way we have some, something to work with. So if you've never seen a SCADA protocol before, you can open up the distribution and have a whole folder full of different SCADA protocols that you can look at. You can open in Wireshark and you can analyze and look at. And to have simulators to go through and try to simulate some of these SCADA systems. So if you've never played with a SCADA system, you can actually talk to one, a simulated SCADA system right inside of the environment. So you can learn how to do the tools and you can learn how to do the assessments. So that's really what Samurai STFU is about and our goals with Samurai STFU. Now here's just a very short list of some of the tools that we have installed on Samurai STFU. Few of them are not currently there. Metasploit currently had to be pulled off because of uh, some dependency issues that we all face with Metasploit if you've ever built it yourself. Um, so Metasploit's not currently in the, next, in, the, in the current release. It should be back in the, uh, the follow-up release that I upload in, in December or January. Um, but you can see just some of the basic networking tools, some of the basic web, web pen testing tools for the wireless tools. Many of you that have done wireless might recognize some of these tools. Most people have heard of Kismet. It's very hard to ever do anything inside a wireless without coming across and playing and falling in love with Kismet. It's a beautiful tool. Uh, Aircrack NG is another one that most people will know. However, Killer B is one that many people don't know. Has anybody in here ever played with Killer B? Oh, we have one person in the whole audience. Oh, two. We have two people in the audience. So Killer B works with another wireless protocol that's very uncommon. Um, well, at least uncommon right now. It's a, a protocol that we're starting to use a lot in critical infrastructure. We're starting to use a lot in home automation and home security systems as well. Um, things like smart appliances that are talking to each other or your thermostat that can talk to your lights inside of your house. So this protocol is called Zigbee. And Killer B is a, a, a tool suite that a very good friend of mine, Joshua Wright, created and released as an open source project to the world to be able to capture Zigbee communication, be able to analyze it, and be able to re-inject and launch attacks inside of, inside of the Zigbee protocol. So that's a, a very popular tool. And then we have RFCAT, which is another tool. Has anybody used RFCAT? A little newer. Okay, nobody in here has played with RFCAT. This is a newer tool. It's only been around for about a year, a year and a half. And a lot of people don't know about this tool yet. RFCAT is a tool that allows us to go through and do penetration testing, capture and replay and analysis of different types of radio frequency communications that are more proprietary in nature, things that don't have a standard protocol. So RFCAT, if you've ever played with NetCAT before, NetCAT allowing you to send tr any type of traffic you want on a, on a, net, on a, a TCP IP network, or receive and analyze any type of traffic, RFCAT tries to do this for radio frequency. So you go through and you tell it exactly what frequencies you want to, to use, and you tell it what protocol or how you want to, to work with that data, and it can go and, and obtain that information or replay that information. Or if it's using frequency hopping, 
RFCAT even has capabilities to try to capture a large sample of the traffic and try to reverse engineer the frequency hopping pattern for you. So very, very beautiful tool. Uh, Atlas and Don Weber, two also very good friends of mine, um, are the, uh, the individuals that wrote this distribution and that, that maintain this distribution. So, and then of course, uh, GNU Radio that uh, is probably a little more popular. It's been around for a number of years. Uh, a tool that is a little challenging to learn, but it's a very beautiful tool once you learn how to use it and you, you become a little bit more familiar with its nuances. And then finally, the very last group of, of test tools that we have are the uh, hardware pen test tools. So things like GoodFet, Bus Pirate, um, tools that allow us to go in and talk directly to electronic components or do bus snooping, basically sniffing the traffic between the electronic components so you can analyze data from circuit boards. Um, so very good tools for that. Total phases are similar tools as well from a commercial company, but they offer some open source software and open source libraries that we have also working, we're working on including in our distribution. And then tools like Entropy Graph and BindDiff to do analysis of that raw data that we've acquired. So the eventual goal and uh, what my hopes are is people can use this distribution to be able to go through and do testing so that we can try to prevent people from attacking our, our critical infrastructure and our systems that we depend on. Now this picture is kind of a wonderful picture. This shows that not all attacks to critical infrastructure are cyber in nature. Some of them are very physical in nature. These organizations worldwide that are dealing with oil, gas, water, and electricity, they are used to people doing types of attacks, fraud types of attacks, trying to get their resources for free. Um, here's an example of uh, sometimes the best way to steal energy is just to take the meter and you remove the meter and you put a jumper there instead. So it's not being tracked. So we can see here three of the, three of the four meters on this, on this building have been removed with jumpers placed um, to be able to steal electricity. So energy theft is something that is very common. We, as we have this in other fields as well. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a way that we can actually test to try to detect to see if people are stealing things not in a physical manner but in a cyber manner. See if they can steal those resources, create fraud or worse, create different types of, of uh, situations that might harm us or shut down or remove the capabilities that we have inside of, inside of our, our nations. So when we look at SCADA systems and control systems, here's a very generic architecture for what we look at for a control system. If you look on the left hand side, there's a master server. Any type of a control system usually is made up of one or more master control servers that talks to several different types of endpoint devices that are deployed either in a manufacturing building or deployed out in remote field locations to monitor the pipelines and the gas lines, to be able to monitor the substations for the electric utilities and monitor how well those resources are, are being used, how efficiently they're being used, um, to be able to turn them on and off and to reroute them around problem areas or uh, to, try to, to try to deal with natural disasters. Now with that master server, there's going to be an interface that people can see and, and understand and look to see what's going on with that master server. And we call this the HMI or the human machine interface. So HMIs provide that interface. And while traditionally an HMI was more of a physical, special proprietary piece of hardware, most HMIs today are simply a web interface. And I'm sure we have a few people in the audience that have been pen testing on web interfaces before. Okay, so once again, the skill sets that we all have, the skill sets that we're learning just in general across IT security are directly applicable inside of control systems. When we look at the master server itself, often the master server is usually running Windows or Linux. These are systems that most of us are very familiar with, systems that we know how to go through and do assessments on and try to identify flaws and vulnerabilities on even if the software, the control system software installed on Windows or installed on Linux might be very fragile and we have to be very careful with, we know how to deal with the operating system as long as there's a couple things that, that you'd be very careful with. Now pushing down into the network and we see other systems like the RTUs or the PLCs. So these are different types of systems in a SCADA network that allow us to be able to talk to some of the outside world and some of the outside processes that are going on. Okay, so RTUs the most common RTUs that we are seeing today that are being sold are simply small embedded Linux boxes. Okay, using an embedded Linux, uh, and a version of embedded Linux, 
or some other type of a real operating system that's, that's been installed on, those, on these little devices. And they have a lot of capabilities of doing things like gateways and, and protocol translation from one protocol to another protocol. So often the RTU has a large number of different protocols it supports and can translate back and forth between. And then it has a small number of interfaces for input output that you can connect to different types of processes. So for instance, you can connect some of the input output of an RTU back to some type of machinery that's uh, doing manufacturing of cars. Or you can have some of the inputs and outputs going out to some type of a meter that's tied to an oil line so you can measure the pressure and measure the, the flow of that oil. Or some type of uh, a, a connection that's going out to a transit, uh, a substation for electric utilities to be able to monitor the voltage and the the currents inside of that that utility and be able to you know change one neighborhood of people from one from one substation to another substation if power goes out of that substation so these are what the RTUs do and PLCs are very similar in but a slightly different purpose they they while there's a lot of overlap between those devices a PLC usually has a, gr a lot greater number of in interfaces on it of input output interfaces and they also usually support ladder logic La capabilities of you can program the PLC to have very very fast and very quick response times to be able to deal with situations so if they see certain types of inputs coming in they can go ahead and they can modify the process so that it can uh, be more adequate or more efficient or cause some type of a, a safety to safety failover to happen so and then but most commonly if you look at the very bottom Often, since that RTU provides some of those more advanced protocols and more gateway type features, often the most commonly way they're deployed for many, for many organizations worldwide are to have the RTU actually talk to several different PLCs. So we have lots of different architectures and the variances between RTUs and PLCs are numerous. I mean, there are literally millions of different, well, maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of different types of RTUs and PLCs um, that have been sold and that are currently being sold. It's not quite like we have many of our computer systems or firewalls where we have a very small handset. Uh, when you go to look at a PLC or an RTU, even if you choose one single company, you end up having a big giant catalog of just all the slight variations of every single PLC and RTU that they have available. Now when we do penetration testing of these systems and you're trying to use a distribution like Samurai STFU to do penetration testing, this allows you to do penetration testing at several different areas. Simply looking at the operating systems at the master layer is not enough. We need to look at some of the security vulnerabilities that might cause problems for us down in those remote stations. Because often the remote stations for oil, water, gas, and energy are in locations where we don't have physical people around. You may have some gates, you may have some fences, you may have some video cameras that aren't being monitored usually um, around these devices to protect them. However, often it's very easy for attackers to get in there. And if we don't have adequate security defenses down at these lower layers, the attackers can have direct control over the processes there, or worse, use cyber attacks to launch at that one single location to affect other remote facilities or possibly even come back into the master server itself and attack the master server itself. So when we're looking at some of these endpoint devices for cyber vulnerabilities, we often will take those endpoint devices and actually pull them apart. If there are security on these endpoint devices, then we often want to disassemble them to see if there's a way that I can find a way around the security on this device. For instance, maybe one of these endpoint RTUs or PLCs has some type of a password on there. And it has an interface, but I can't get into it without having the proper password. So the solution, take it apart and see if you can pull the password directly off the flash chip. Because it often is just sitting there waiting for you to take it. So what we want to do is when we do our penetration test, we disassemble the device and we try to identify the different components in that device. We try to identify the microcontrollers and the microprocessors. We identify the flash chips and the EEPROM chips. And then we use special hardware and tools from Samurai STFU to go in and try to pull that data off. Um, and when we pull that data off, it's very similar to taking like a forensics image of a hard drive if you've ever done that. However, we don't have file systems in most circumstances. And we are dealing with raw data that we have to go through and try to analyze. So it, it, it does make it a little bit more challenging with some of the data sets we're working with. The good news is at least we're working with very small data sets, um, often only a few megs in size, 
um, compared to up to a terabyte with some of the, the forensics images that you have in, in the normal IT world. When we're working with these individual chips and we're trying to talk to each of these individual chips, often it's good to know what, um, what type of protocol they speak because you have to have some knowledge of the protocols to be able to talk directly with an EEPROM chip or directly with the flash chip. When we know these protocols, two of the most common protocols we have are I2C and SPI. So here's an example of what the I2C protocol looks like because you have to actually understand this to talk to it because we don't have tools that usually will, will do this for you, at least at a, a very good degree. So that's one thing that when I teach my five-day penetration, I have a five-day penetration testing class for SCADA and control systems that I'm working with Blue Kaizen to bring here to Egypt for the first time um, or anywhere in the Middle East even. Um, Dubai we're actually talking about right now in the springtime. But right now I've been teaching this class for Black Hat and for some other, other venues around the world. And this is one of the slides that we actually do inside of the class as we're going through and, and launching these attacks and trying to understand these protocols. Oops. Another thing that we do after we, we look at these protocols and try to pull information off the protocols is we want to do bus snooping. So when we have different components like Flash and EEPROMs, we can talk directly to these chips, but sometimes there may be some type of security defense on that chip that prevents me from pulling data off of it. So the next best thing that we can do is we can usually bring other types of hardware, come in and tap into that chip and monitor all the I.O. lines to that chip. And then we shut the device down, bring the device up, and we watch the boot process. Because often these chips will communicate with other components. Or if they have some network, network devices or some radio frequency chips on there, we can usually see them initiate conversations back with the different components they're talking to and capture information that's coming to this chip. For instance, if there's a firmware update being pushed down to this device, we can usually use bus snipping to capture that firmware update as it's coming down to the device. Or if this device is using uh, uh, some type of a, an RF communications and it has a separate RF chip on there. Often during the initialization process, the microcontroller will pass the password over to that RF chip to be able to start doing the encryption as part of the boot process and we can capture that password as it's being transferred. Or if that password is not being transferred, sometimes if there's frequency hopping, the microcontroller itself will actually pass information about the channels to jump to. And you can monitor those communications and actually see the communication from the microcontroller to the RF chip saying, jump now, jump now, jump now, jump now, and see which frequency they're actually jumping to so we can reverse engineer the pattern that way. So there's lots of different capabilities that we have by going through and looking at some of these, these components. If we can capture the firmware off the device, we can disassemble that firmware device on that device and start trying to identify if there's any passwords that have been permanently encoded or embedded in that firmware. We can also try to find algorithms to see if they have different ways that maybe they're doing uh, key derivation schemes and we can recover the key derivation algorithm and identify the inputs being used for that derivation scheme. Or possibly there may be some asymm ECC asymmetric keys that have been stored on that firmware device that we can extract back out the device so then we can try to spoof that device or try to Im imitate that device. So, and then finally, just like in the, the, the normal IT world, is we can look for vulnerabilities like buffer overflow-like vulnerabilities so that we can try to launch attacks at these devices remotely. As for the communications on these devices, many times these devices will either be speaking some type of uh, Ethernet TCP communications, some type of a serial communication through, uh, through some type of a serial line, which is more traditional, which they are starting to move away from, but still probably the most common we have, um, or radio frequency communications. So what this screenshot is right here is this is a screenshot of GNU radio of going through and acquiring, capturing some information that's, that's flowing across the, the wire. In fact, if we, look, if we look at the details, probably hard to see from the audience, we're capturing communications from the 900 megahertz, which is the most common range. The 915 um, band inside the United States is the most common that we have for passing different types of sensitive information. So capturing that information, taking it, demodulating that information, and then recovering the data stream, the actual data that's been broadcast over the wire or over the air. Then we also have uh, different protocols. If we're working with TCP IP, we can go straight to TCP IP and do captures with tools like TCP dump and Wireshark. So what this slide is, this slide's uh, some of the most common protocols that we actually have 
um, that you may see if you're using TCP IP. So as well as the port numbers that they're, that they're currently often associated with. Now, if you're using a tool like Wireshark, Wireshark has dissectors for about half of these protocols. The other half, you're often up to trying to figure out for yourself what's being transmitted back and forth. Um, so anybody that is getting into this work and finds a new protocol that Wireshark doesn't support, please, for community, let's build this, some dissectors and try to get some dissectors uploaded so we can all benefit from these dissectors, just like the people that have gone before us and built dissectors for us for these protocols we currently do have. Now, I mentioned earlier on that most penetration testers have 80% of the knowledge to be able to do this work already. There's only a little bit more information you need to understand um, about these protocols and about how the systems work. But one thing that we also have to understand are what do we need to do? What are we used to doing in an IT network that we simply can't do in a control system network? Okay, so one of the things that we have is port scanning, something that we don't think of in the IT world. Port scanning is port scanning. We port scan everything and it doesn't usually cause problems. Well, yes, we know that sometimes we might crash a printer. Okay, but crashing a printer is different than shutting off power for a city. So what we have to do is we have to be able to be very careful when we're doing things like port scanning, either with tools like Nessus or using vulnerability scanners like Qualys and Nessus. Um, and rap, you know, Rapid7, all these other tools that are out there. Because when we go through and, and do things like, when we do our port scanning, we have to be very careful not to cause problems or not to cause the, the processes to hang. The, uh, the level of security robustness going in these devices is far below average. So we have to be very careful, especially when we get to some of the older devices, which may not even be running on a traditional operating system. You get to some of the old devices, the endpoint devices being deployed in the field, and you do a normal NMAP scan, default, nothing special, some of these devices will fall over dead. I mean, there's no, no control over them. Often the reason why is because they're not running some TCP IP stack from Linux or from Windows, but it's some C compiled program that one single, one single developer created and he created it in as little time as possible to be able to just barely speak TCP IP. And something like receiving a packet that is not according to these, the, the TCP IP standard, he doesn't have an error condition to handle that. And he just kind of freezes and hangs and says, I don't know what to do. And that causes some of these devices to fall over. So when we're doing port scanning, some of the things that we have to be very careful in, and this is another slide that I talk about, or another section that we talk about inside of, inside of my course, is when we're doing NMAP scans or using anything that does generates network traffic, doing things like operating system fingerprint actually causes the most problems for us. Because the way that NMAP and all the other tools out there use to try to identify what operating system you're running as you're doing port scanning, is it sends malformed TCP IP packets. Combinations that the RFC said should never exist. And NMAP uses the way the system replies to these to try to identify which operating system it is. Well, when we're talking to control systems that have their own custom TCP IP stacks that don't have error conditions set for these non-standard communications, like I said, they get stuck in endless loops or sometimes they end up taking the wrong route down some tree inside of their programming and has weird things start happening on the device. Maybe it locks up, maybe it has a large delay or maybe it overwrites the firmware which is the strangest thing in the world, but yes, sometimes you can override a firmware by fuzzing one of these devices on the network, which makes no sense, but that's the life we live right now. Um, scanning too fast is another problem. Nmap does this very, very horrible thing. Nmap actually tries to talk to more than one port at a time on a single system. So most of our computer systems were made for that. Control systems, they don't like that. We have to tell Nmap or any type of scanner that we're using to only ever send one traffic response or one, one port scan request per IP address. You can scan 100 IP addresses all at the same time if you want, assuming that you don't have problems with the switch, which is another problem that we sometimes have in the control system world. But as long as we're only sending one single packet at a time and we wait for that response to complete and then we talk to that device again, then we can usually scan that device, assuming we follow all the other devices, or all the other advice on this slide as well, without too much of a problem. So doing things like setting a T2 timing for, for Nmap, which basically tells it to only send one single request at a time and wait 0.4 seconds in between each request. That's fairly safe to do. Or you can kind of speed it up a little bit more 
um, by saying a scandalay, setting a scandalay time of something like a, a, a 0.1 to be able to, to speed that up a little bit more. Scanning UDP ports is another big problem. When Nmap or any of the other tools like Nessus and Koala scan, scan UDP ports, they'll actually send a request in with a null packet, a null payload. Okay, the way that UDP works, it just, you have to talk to the protocol. The operating system doesn't generate any response. If an operating system like Linux and Windows receives a UDP request, it immediately passes it over to whatever program's running it. It doesn't do anything in the TCP IP stack. It just passes it directly over. And the Nmap doesn't know what it's speaking, so it just usually sends a null payload, nothing inside of the payload, just to see if that protocol will respond. Well, sometimes these cause problems if we're talking to SCADA protocols that listen on UDP ports. So they see something coming in and they expect traffic and the developer that wrote them never provided an error condition path to be able to deal with a packet that he receives that doesn't have anything inside of it. So that sometimes causes some of these services to lock up. So we have to be careful with UDP ports. And then finally, fingerprinting, if you're, if you're looking at fingerprinting on TCP, we also, that generally doesn't cause problems, but we, we should be very careful and make sure that uh, we're familiar with our networks before we're doing it. So what we often do, if we're going to be trying to talk to these devices and try to find vulnerabilities, the first piece of advice, you usually don't do anything on the field devices. You just kind of step away from them and look at them. Maybe do packet capture, see what they're there. Maybe go out there and do an ARP scan with Nmap, just to see what's there and collect the MAC addresses of everything to fingerprint them that way. When we're working with the servers themselves, it's usually best not to do port scanning if you have any concerns, unless you're familiar with the devices and you have people there and everybody accepts the risk of doing the port scans and you have somebody knowledgeable doing it. Um, but often if you want to do vulnerability scanning on the servers, the safest way is to turn off all port scanning and only do authenticated tests. So go to Qualys, go to, go to Nessus and say, hey, I want you to do an authenticated test so don't try to ping, you know, you can ping to see if you're there, but don't try to port scan. Just go log into this device, here's the username and password, and then pull down the patch level. Do a net stat to pull down which ports are open using net stat instead of trying to port scan. Okay, go see what third party software is installed and analyze this. And then start building your own rules to say, hey, for this one single SCADA protocol or SCADA service, go check the configuration file to see if it's actually been set properly. Here's how it should be set. So there's a great profile or a great uh, project that was done by a company called Digital Bond, the project's Bandolier, which is a series of different types of Nessus audits that you can plug into Nessus, Nessus Pro to be able to go through and do that communication and do these, assess these assessments of the different protocols that are there. Um, this is freely available. You can download it straight from their website for free. So, and then of course doing packet captures is also a very safe way where you're not generating any, any traffic. The other thing we have to be careful with is with the web world. So for, you, for those of you that have done web pen testing, well, most of our tools for web pen testing do things like spidering a site, okay? Basically crawling through that website trying to find all the pages or running automated scanners to go through and find vulnerabilities in those requests. Well, unfortunately these tools that are doing the spidering capability and the, the scanning capability, they try to go through and make every single get request and post request that's available. Well, so on a critical control system, how do you shut down the flow of oil through the pipe? You click on the button that says stop the flow, which sends a post request. What's your spider going to do when you just say, hey, go spider this website? <laughs> it's going to stop the flow of oil. Okay, or if you have embedded devices that have capabilities of sending a firmware update out to a, a, a one of those field devices that, that might be clear out in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, and you run your automated scanning tool and it sees a little drop down box. What does it try to do with the drop down box? Well, it tries to go through and run every single one of those. So if there's a drop down box with firmware to update and you have 10 different firmwares, it's gonna to try to send all 10 of those firmwares within one single second of each other. And that endpoint device, it might be smart enough, notice the keyword might, might be smart enough to realize that, hey, more than one firmware is being sent down to it and say, stop, and only let one firmware in. Some of them aren't even that smart, and they'll try flashing 10 firmwares at one single time, overriding each other, which is very bad. Uh, but even if they do stop and say, hey, one at a time, often the one that gets sent first is the oldest firmware, which usually disconnects that device from the server because this, the, the current version of the server usually has to be in sync with the current version of the firmware. 
So now we may end up having a device in the middle of the desert that we may have to fly out to, to be able to get to, that stop communicating. And we can't get to it remotely anymore. We have to, go we have to physically go out there to reflash that device. So that becomes a, a very, very huge problem for us um, as we're using these different types of, of systems that are out there. So as for availability for this distribution, so Samurai STFU is uh, currently available right now. You can get it from samuraistfu.org. Um, it's a free download. There's no registration. It's all open source. Uh, feel free to use it as, as, you, as you see fit. Um, there's uh, lots of different uh, capabilities of using it. If you have any questions, my contact information is on this next slide and uh, will, be, will be available. Feel free to, to, to reach out to me and, and any questions that you might have. Um, with using the distribution. Uh, if you are working inside of this field or working for a company that does work with control systems and SCADA systems and critical infrastructure, um, by all means, if you want some more professional level training, that is something that, uh, that we do offer and we are trying to, to bring here to the Middle East. So we have several different upcoming courses that are available um, and I try to keep all those courses updated online as well on the Samurai STFU site. So if anybody is interested in those courses, that is, that is always an option as well. So as for my contact information, here is my contact information. Feel free to use it. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and open up for questions. Any questions? Uh, when we're talking about the software development field, uh, we find that there's uh, some sort of maturity in terms of uh, security awareness. Uh, we have so many libraries we have built in. Uh, security into the framework the operating system. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of mature. Uh, how much mature is it in the world of SCADA and control systems? I mean, in comparison. Of those list of protocols that I had up on the screen, some of them actually have authentication. <laughs> <laughs> One or two of them have encryption. We, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, often we are using other types of mitigating controls, things like VPN solutions, um, to be able to tunnel these insecure protocols across. Um, we are actively working on uh, various different types of international projects um, with the standards bodies to, to create new protocols that are out there that do have security capabilities built into them. Um, some areas, some sectors, like uh, smart meters is something that's, that's a, an area that's very popular worldwide. Um, even in here in the Middle East, I've spoken to many companies um, in the Gulf area that's working on smart meter technologies. Um, the smart meter technologies probably, in my opinion, are actually the furthest along, mostly because it's a new technology that's only been around five or six years. And so as it's been developed, they have brought some of that current mindset of security into it. So they're fairly well with their security position. Not perfect, but better than the rest of the industry. A lot of the other SCADA devices, though, um, we're doing the same thing that we've always done with the SCADA devices, and we've never had that level of security. So it, it is a bit of a concern. Right, so how, how is it when it comes to the hardware level or the VLCs? Very little effort has ever been thought about. It's, it's only been the last few years that um, security researchers have been trying to challenge that and trying to help them identify that the fact that they need to do more. So. Some, some of the tools that you mentioned requires hardware. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are there any specific recommendations for the hardware for bus looping, for example, or RF manipulation? <sighs> Not yet. Um, the best recommendations usually are on each of those respective websites. So, if you want to use RFCAT, go to the RFCAT's website and they give recommendations. Um, same thing with GNU Radio. Uh, I do need to go through, and that's one of my one of my to do lists on the distribution is to to provide a list of different pieces of, of hardware that's recommended. Another thing that I want to do is I also sometime want to do a blog post on what my current hardware pen test kit is. So people can actually see what, what I currently use when I'm doing my hardware pen test and try to do it in kind of a graduated scale. So basically says, hey, here's a limited budget. You want to do this work. What's the cheapest way to do it so that you can actually get into it? What's kind of the middle of the road? Or if money's not an object, you know, here's you know, the list of, of tools that you probably want to bring into your lab. So that way it helps the hobbyist, it helps the individual researcher that is basically funding his own research, and it also helps the large organizations that are trying to build a very, very robust security team to do this type of work. So. Yeah, is, is 
this PLC device on the internet and it's there in it. Can I use Google Docs or something like that to uh, get access to them? <laughs> yes, most control systems are not on the internet, thank goodness, uh, because they're very, very poor with their security. However, sometimes we do have some systems that do get exposed to the, to the internet. Some of these devices, we simply have to have remote connectivity too. So if we have some remote station out in the middle of the desert, we have to have some way to be able to get to that, some way to be able to talk to that device. Most of the time they'll use some type of proprietary mechanism or some type of a VPN through um, hopefully something not connected to the internet. But for some areas, they either make the mistake or that was the only reasonable business move they could make is to simply connect it directly to the internet. Hopefully they have some type of VPN connection. But yeah, so most of the time, most are not connected. But if they are, probably the best way to do them, you can try Google Dorks and Google Hacking. The better way is probably using Shodan. Shodan is, uh, is a better way to be able to find some of these items because Shodan collects all the banners and you can simply search for the, the appropriate banner for the device that's, that's being exposed. And just so you can see, this is actually the distribution if you wanted to see what the distribution looks like. So inside of the distribution, if you come over to the applications, we have Samurai STFU has a menu item. And then depending on the type of system that you want to work with, so embedded electronics, the field technician interfaces, RF communications, network protocols, or user interfaces like web, um, then you can go in and look at those different steps. And then you go into each one of them and it breaks it down to the methodology that I created for it. So here's each step in the methodology that we're using um, to data sheet analysis, dumping data at rest, data snooping, doing strings analysis, entropy analysis. So lots of different capabilities of, of doing these, these different mechanisms. So, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.